Many of you know Claire Kavanaugh from her prize-winning books, most recently the one I just mentioned. Just two weeks ago, she won the National Book Critics Circle Award in Criticism, um, as well as from her many, many translations of Wisława Zimborska, Adam Zagajewski, my Polish grandmother is rolling over in her grave, um, and other Polish poets uh, who have whose translations have appeared in the TLS, the New York Times Book Review, The New Yorker, The New York Review of Books, Book Forum, Partisan Review, Poetry, Literary Imagination, and many other periodicals. Um, I actually had the good fortune to get to know Claire uh, when both of us were assistant professors at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and um, we shared many uh, laughs together about our uh, rather dysfunctional, complet, uh, and not so much Slavic departments, uh, but it was great having someone of her caliber and her talent and her great sense of humor uh, while I was suffering through my own assistant professorship at Madison. Uh, we obviously did escape. I'm now here as the director of the Humanities Initiative. Uh, very grateful to the School of Journalism for giving us this wonderful space for tonight. And Claire, as I mentioned, uh, has been at uh, Northwestern University uh, where she is professor of Slavic comparative literature and gender studies. She will be joined tonight by um, another Wisconsin um, product, Elliot Bornstein, who has been here at NYU as a professor of Russian and Slavic studies since 1995. Prior to that, he was at the University of Virginia. Um, his many works include Men Without Women, Masculinity and Revolution in Russian, Russian Fiction, Overkill, Sex and Violence in Contemporary Russian Popular Culture, and uh, two years ago, he had a Guggenheim Fellowship to finish the companion volume to the latter work, um, and he's currently writing. Elliot, are you finished? Um, you're not finished. Currently writing. Thanks to the Guggenheim, he's much further along than he would have been. Uh, Catastrophe of the Week, Apocalyptic Entertainment in Post-Soviet Russia. Uh, so it's wonderful for me to be reunited with Claire, for Elliot to be reunited. Um, maybe, maybe it's not so great for him to be reunited with two of his teachers at Wisconsin. Uh, but again, it's great for us to have a Wisconsin Home Week here in, in New York City. Let me just say a little bit more about uh, Claire Kavanaugh. Um, in addition to winning um, this year's National Book Critics Circle Award in Criticism, she's also won a number of other awards during her uh, very uh, sterling career. Her first book, Ozit Mandelstam and the Modernist Creation of Tradition, received the prize for the outstanding scholarly book in Slavic literature. Um, and as an acclaimed translator, she has won the John Frederick Nims Memorial Prize in Translation, the Catherine Washburn Memorial Lecture in Translation, the Penn Book of the Month Club Prize for Outstanding Literary Translation, and the AATS EEL Award for Outstanding Translation from a Slavic Language. I think it's safe to say that uh, as wonderful as Zimborska's poetry is, she probably would not have received the Nobel Prize without the fabulous translations that Claire and her own mentor at Harvard, uh, Baranchak, um, uh, had done of Zimborska's work over the last 20 years. So again, it's with great uh, pride and pleasure that I welcome Claire Kavanaugh tonight. After she speaks, uh, Elliot will give a response, and then we will open the floor for your questions. Thank you. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here, and Elliot and I even go back further than Jane and I. Jane and I used to have our children eating sand together at the beach um, when they were like that big, and amazingly, they survived. Um, Elliot, I've known since his last year at Oberlin, but we're not going to go there. The decades are piling up. Um, anyhow, what I'm going to be talking about some is, is the basic thrust of my, my argument, and I wanted to begin... Um, in the book at large and then kind of branch into some other stuff that keeps occurring to me because I was pulling up so much stuff on the web and other sources about the nature of lyric poetry in modern society today for us. But I wanted to begin, I have a quote in the book, it's actually the beginning quote of the book that comes from an NYU faculty member and I wanted to use, from Maureen McLean, and I wanted to use that to introduce um, my topic. This is what she wrote in the Chicago Tribune. I just happened to be going to the Chicago Tribune and suddenly this, this jumped out of the book page. Um, she writes, what would American poets and critics do without the, can everybody hear me okay? Do I have to, because this thing is like right at nose level. If, if I sneeze, it'll be a disaster. Um, what would American poets and critics do without the Central Europeans and the Russians to browbeat themselves with? 
Um, Miłosz, Wisława Szymborska, Adam Zagajewski, Zbigniew Herbert, Joseph Brodsky. Here we have world historical seriousness, weight, importance. Even their playfulness is weighty, metaphysical, unlike barbaric American noodlings. Well, so what this means is by into the 21st century, um, Eastern European poetry in American culture and Eastern European poets as the poets of the great oppressed nations who suffer and die for art as opposed to American poets who would, who would die to suffer and die. Um, <laughs> it's become such a cliche that Maureen McLean can, can make fun of it and she's, she's absolutely right. Um, I, I went through at one point obsessively collecting quotes from American poets and reading all the reviews from about 1965, 66 when Eastern European poetry first burst on the scene. Um, and you can see there already there's this amazing conflation of dates. What happened really um, as far as Polish poetry goes, and Polish poetry, even as Maureen McLean's list suggests, it's all Poles except for Brodsky, and Brodsky himself said that Polish poetry was the greatest poetry of the 20th century. He learned Polish so he could read it. So, I mean, I, I'm not saying I agree, I'm just, you know. Um, but, but Brodsky kind of considered himself in, in some, an honorary Pole in some ways. Um, what you see going back is 65, 66, 67, Miłosz publishes a post -war, an anthology of post-war Polish poetry, uh, a volume of Zbigniew Herbert's work in poetry, and time and again I've heard one you know, illustrious American poet after another, and most recently just the last two days there have been events for Miłosz's centenary saying those books changed their world. They changed their perception of poetry utterly. And you can see late 60s poetry, politics, the sense that American poetry is off on the sidelines while the students are in the streets rioting, while we're having the Vietnam War, that something has to change and Polish poetry was it. Um, and as you see from Maureen McLean's quote, um, it's become a cliche by now. The poetry of witness, the poets who suffer. I have one quote in here. Um, see if I can find it. My favorite quote, which I will not attribute, because um, I'm not sure where the person is. Um, I've never met the person. Is, uh, this, this, is the, this came from, I think, a review of Miłosz's um, collected poems about 20 years ago, his first version of collected poems. She said, Polish poets have a completely unfair advantage due to the, and I'm quoting here, the dazzling range of demeaning possibilities, the spectacularly variegated dire straits that history has bestowed upon any poet fortunate enough to be born in 20th century Poland. Uh, the national life against which they seem to contend is the aftermath of every sort of war and oppression. Um, well, there are advantages to coming from countries that are a little less turbulent. Um, another quote that comes up very frequently is Mandelstam saying in the early 30s, um, he says, nowhere do they respect poetry more than in the Soviet Union. Um, they kill more poets here than anyone else, anywhere else. <laughs> Again, advantages to coming from places that love their poets a little less. Um, but in any case, that's become the myth. So on the one hand, when you look at contemporary American, and not just American, um, Anglophone poetry generally, um, you see these poets have pride of place. There's this myth, there's this cult. And once again, you can see this little mantra of names coming up time and again whenever there's a discussion of poetry and politics poetry and witness poetry and engagement and so forth. Um, then, so as a translator particularly, but also as a scholar, I've been aware of that for years and years and years since my first book, Osip Mandelstam and the Modernist Creation of Tradition, um, was also about one of those poets who's a cult figure, who figures on all of these lists, who, I'm already, who I've already quoted. Then there's this, this kind of schizophrenia um, I experience as a scholar. You go over to the scholarship and Eastern Europe is absent in discussions of poetry and politics, in discussions of literature and politics, in discussions of post-colonialism. I think it's um, Jameson who says somewhere, he's talking about post-colonialism, he says, what post-colonialism means to us today is the first world and the third world. And you, are you missing a finger? One, two, three. There's a whole block of the world that doesn't enter into the discussion. Um, and it's particularly germane in terms of poetry. Uh, one of the things I look at in the book, um, and I have, I think, a couple of the quotes. I, I'm not going to go through all of these quotes, but I just put them here so that I can refer to them actually, rather than having to read things. Um, um, one of the quotes I have here is from Jerome McGann, um, and he and his student Marjorie Levinson were two of the key figures in a turn against lyric poetry that figures precisely on questions of ideology and politics. 
Um, and here I have a quote at the very bottom that's derived from McGann's romantic ideology where he says, it is the romantic grand delusion that poetry can set one free of the ruins of history and culture with which contemporary criticism much do must do battle, I paraphrase him a bit, since romantic poetry, and I'm quoting here directly, typically erases or sets aside its political and historical currencies. So I found myself in this acute mode of cognitive dissonance. On the one hand, I'm translating writers, working on writers as a scholar, getting to know writers who are considered the paragons of poetic engagement. On the other hand, I'm dealing with a body of scholarship that extends back about 30 years now that says romantic poetry, which gets used as a trope for modern poetry generally, and which specifically focuses on the lyric, is the mode of engagement, of disengagement from the world, and Wordsworth is the exemplar because he begins as a supporter of the French Revolution and then withdraws from the French Revolution. I'll get that back to that in a, um, just a minute here. But just as a way of pointing out how radically different, um, I don't know, radically different the traditions are, there's some truth in that in the Polish and Russian tradition. I won't go into all of that here because the poets were considered by the people at large, the bards, the speakers of the national truth that have been repressed by political and historical circumstances, but also a, a difference in perception here. One way to focus on that, and again, I'm doing this a little bit shorthand, but it was very striking to me, is the poem that comes in, poor Wordsworth is the whipping boy for all the new historicists. He gets it left and right, and the poem that's considered to mark his withdrawal from history is Tintern Abbey. Now, I'm not going to go into that whole argument, but what I did want to bring up, this is something that I was poking around in, and I kept finding over and over again in key places in Czesław Miłosz, for whom these events recently have been organized, who's considered sort of the, the grand, the great patriarch of, of politically engaged poetry, in a few key places, references to Tintern Abbey. Uh, the first one I found in his great book, The Captive Mind, 1953, it marks his break. He, he was engaged um, with the Polish Communist Party immediately following World War II. Um, he didn't join the party, but he was a cultural attaché. He was kind of a feather in their cap, a, a, an eminent poet who becomes a cultural attaché. He served here in New York. He served in Washington, D.C. He served in Paris. You can tell how well the guy was doing because he got all of the sort of primo postings. Um, at the same time he's doing this, he's, he's contesting it, and he's contesting it, oddly enough, by way of Wordsworth. Um, what he says in The Captive Mind, which is the book he writes after he breaks with the party and seeks political exile in Paris, what he writes is, he says, under the communist regime, the poet is free to describe hills, trees, and flowers. Okay, you can do a little pretty landscaping, you can do a little decoration. Um, but if the poet should feel that boundless exaltation in the face of nature that seized Wordsworth on his visit to Tintern Abbey, he is at once suspect. If the poet should feel the exaltation that Wordsworth feels on um, visiting Tintern Abbey, he's at once suspect. Well, why would a poet be politically suspect in Poland for being seized with rapture at Tintern Abbey? Why would that poem, the poem that's taken as the emblem of being politically distanced, as disengaged, um, become suspect? Well, because it's private interior rapture. You don't do private interior rapture in a, a programmatically public state. Raptures are reserved for public occasions, the kind of formal odes, not the kind of internalized romantic ode. It's back to an 18th century tradition of the ode. And Miłosz knows about this firsthand. Um, how does he know about it? Well, during his stay in, uh, during his involuntary stay in a way, he was in Nazi-occupied Warsaw, for most of World War II, um, he started learning English. Apparently a couple of Quakers got stranded in Warsaw and they didn't have anything else to do. What do you do if you're a Quaker stranded in Nazi-occupied Warsaw? You give Czesław Miłosz English lessons. Um, so he, he started learning English. The first two things he translated, I love this, this is Miłosz in a nutshell, um, were Shakespeare and T.S. Eliot. Um, so he started small. Um, <laughs> But he translated The Wasteland. His first translation of The Wasteland dates from wartime Warsaw. He continued this sort of fanatical attention to English language poetry as an antidote to the problems he saw in Polish poetry. Again, we get one of these weird bifurcations I was talking about in the beginning. Um, 
both during the war and after. What he used his postings in New York and Washington for, he was supposed to be sending back bulletins on life in the decadent capitalist West, you know, get them back, get all the hot scoops on what's going on in New York and Washington as far as politics. He was, he was reading American, specifically American poetry, obsessively and translating constantly. He found American, po he said American poetry sets out a path that Poles need to follow. And in fact, he did sort of wrench um, the orientation of modern Polish poetry away from France and towards America through this translation. What one of the poems he translated, not just, I, I'm emphasizing American, but he translated Tintern Abbey. Um, and he put together an, uh, an anthology, I think in 1947, and tried to get it published in People's Poland and couldn't get it published. Tintern Abbey would not go through. So he knew firsthand that that was the kind of poem that gets censored in Poland um, censored with an O and censured in, in New Historicism. So you end up again with this strange kind of bifurcation and he quotes um, Wordsworth, he's writing to a friend while he's stationed in Washington saying, I can't bear this socialist realist lyrics anymore. What am I going to do? He says, emotion, uh, he says, poetry is emotion recollected in tranquility and there's an end of it. So what he does is he quotes from Wordsworth's famous um, preface to the preludes to say this is what poetry must do as a poet to enforce collectivization from the outside. So it's one of these strange flips around that makes you start thinking there's something wrong. Usually when you can define the same poem in two radically different ways, it means it's capable of, I'm old fashioned, I think the interpretations are generated through the poems themselves. The poem itself contains contradictions um, and generates multiple possibilities. The, the recent critical trend, recent meaning of the last few decades in the West, has been shutting down a whole set of possibilities that are activated, I think, or that we recognize more clearly in the Polish tradition. And that's what I want to go to now, is look at some of these examples, specific examples of poems. You have them on your handouts. Oh, let's see, which one do I start with here? Okay, yeah, here, I have one here. I'm gonna be mentioning some of the ways in which the Eastern European traditions diverge, and some of it I found online. And if you wanna figure out new possibilities of poetry, Elliot and I were just talking about it, the web is absolutely extraordinary for lyric poetry. Everything on the handout I pulled off the web. I'd left some copies at home. I'm old fashioned. I think I need to Xerox. Poetry, all of it is on the web, but sometimes it's mutilated. Sometimes there's a word changed. It's the new oral poetry. The new form of oral transmission is on the web. Anyhow, I pulled these off. I got one of the line breaks wrong um, because I pulled it off the web and the, the web doesn't respect poetic form. It doesn't do line breaks correctly always. But this is the first one I got here. It's just my literal translation underneath here. This is a poem written by Osip Mandelstam in 1931. And um, rather than read it in Russian, what I'm going to do is just to indicate some of the difference, I can't go into all of it obviously, of public poetry in the Eastern European context. Um, it gets set to music all the time. It's part of the culture that, that, since Romanticism particularly, that the poetry is actively set to music and people learn the songs by heart without even knowing they're learning a poem. Um, the example I always give, and Elliot will know this one, I'm sure, is from the most famous ever Soviet romantic comedy. There is such a thing. Um, it's not that funny, but it's Ironia Sudbui. All the lyrics are taken from the most difficult of all Russian modernist poets, Marina Tsvetaeva, and set to music. It's what I keep thinking is, it's like, you know, you do Emily Dickinson lyrics to a Drew Barrymore comedy. I mean, it just, it's, it's something that's unimaginable here. But this, I found a song online for this poem, and I just want to, rather than read it in Russian, I'm going to give you the song. or a little piece of it at any rate. It's a very short poem. And you can follow along in the English, which is quite literal. Oh, geez, is it gonna? Hmm? Everybody says it. <laughs> yeah, let's have a sing-along. <laughs> um, it's not coming up here. I mean, we've been having problems getting the web, so I may not be able, and I'm not gonna sing the song. I really, I, I, you know, I could, I will. Anyhow, no, I, I left my guitar at home. Um, yeah, it's not pulling up. We'll see if it pulls up by accident here. It's a, um, it's a guitar song. Does anybody, Elliot, do you want to try and? Well, it was clearly connected to the back of the page, so I think it might be a problem with the link. Well, it was working not too long. It was working on my, uh, it was working at the hotel. You can all come back to the hotel with me afterwards. And, 
Let's see. Yeah. yeah. It's, 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 it's not pulling up. Let's see. It pulled up. One of them pulled up right before we. Press on that one. The MP3. Just press on. Yeah. It's not. Well, let's try the other one before to make sure that that's not the wrong thing. Well, let's, let's just wait. The other one comes later. Anyhow, I'm just going to leave this for here. Anyhow, and maybe it will come up like in the next 10 minutes if somebody starts singing That's This Guy. Um, but the, there's a whole set of Mandel Stamm songs set to guitar music here. But what this poem is, it's important to look at the date, 1931. Mandelstam is already poet non, poeta non gratis in, the, in the, uh, the Soviet Union. He's already been branded as an outsider for all kinds of reasons. Um, and one of them particularly is that he's supposed to be petty bourgeois. Um, he couldn't become petty bourgeois until the Soviet Union came along because he was actually the son of a, a Jewish tanner who only got into um, Petersburg University by, there was a quota on Jews, his father was a tradesman, he didn't have stellar grades by converting to what's been called Finnish Methodism, which is apparently the easiest conversion you could do so he could get into the university. But suddenly after, because he's sort of the purveyor of high culture, writing little what one critic called chamber poetry, um, he becomes, he bears what one of the Soviet critics called the Mandelstamp of petty bourgeois society. So how does he deal with bearing this Mandelstamp? He takes a traditional poetic genre, which is the toast, which is a social and public gesture that he knows cannot be published. Um, he publishes, I think, maybe three poems after this in the official Soviet press. And he uses it to do, the avant-garde mode is always saying, you know, slap in the face of petty bourgeois taste, slap in the face of bourgeois taste. What he's doing here is a slap in the face of official communist taste. I drink to the milk. And so on. I drink to the military asters. The explanation I read of this is that it's uh, the epaulets on um, czarist uniforms. Um, to all that they've scolded me for, so for petty bourgeois culture, to a noble fur coat, to asthma, it's Proust, you know, asthma is an effete disease, um, to a bilious Petersburg day, not Leningrad, but Petersburg, the music of Savoy pine trees, what you get in here is all sorts of product placement of Aunt Lalette. You get Rolls Royces, um, let's see, what are some of the other, Chateauneuf de Pop, Asti Spumanti, um, and so forth. All these, you know, the highfalutin, you know, poo shishi brand names he's throwing in here, he's throwing in Europe, Parisian pictures, oil paint, Champs-Élysées, and so forth. He's listing every single thing you could hit him for um, as being a petty bourgeois social climber and saying, that's what I am in your face, basically, or up yours to be less. So what, he's do what is he doing here with the lyric? Um, well, according to the definitions that defined it as a socially um, separated, disengaged genre, um, he's turning it into a public gesture that he cannot make publicly, um, that he cannot articulate publicly, that will never be put into press, and turning the whole genre of epatage, slapping the petty bourgeois through your, your avant-garde poetry, futurist poetry, Dadaist poetry, whatever, um, turning it right around. So it is the lyric as a pointedly politically engaged genre. Okay, Safari can't open this page, you'll never hear the song now. But I wanted you to at least be aware that these things are public forms as well. This becomes much more serious in the case of Anna Akhmatova, who you have on the next page. And I printed the same poem twice because she published, or she wrote the same poem in two different forms. Akhmatova was Mandelstam's great sort of compadre, confederate in what was called the Acmeus movement, Akhmatova's history is really specific and it shows how um, involved the Soviet Union was with the question of literary genre, with the question of lyric specifically. Akhmatova in, I think, 1921, 1922, a very well-known critic gave a public lecture saying Akhmatova, Anna Akhmatova, who was a lady who came from aristocracy, um, brought up by I, I, her father, I believe, was a military officer whose husband was executed for, her first husband was executed for counter-revolutionary activities in 1921. Um, Akhmatova was considered the emblem, the exemplar um, of everything wrong with lyric poetry. And this critic inadvertently fed into this um, in this lecture he gave where he said, Akhmatova is the past, she represents everything 
of high, old, ancient Russian society, everything that's gone. Mayakovsky, Elliot can tell you more about this, is the new masculine forward voice of the future. So it ended up in an ideological paradigm. There's one kind of lyric that's the lyric of the future that's masculine, that's collective, that's um, forward motivated. And then there's a Kamatova who looks back, who is feminine, effete, the past, bourgeois family, and so forth. Um, and it worked. They needed to, they used this precisely for attack. They said, this came up in all the Soviet press, um, one attack after the other. Akhmatova's poetry is all these petty little love lyrics. Akhmatova's um, poetry, that the turf tramped by Akhmatova's poetry goes from the croquet match to the tea table to the boudoir and back again. That is the train she stakes out in her poetry. Um, and she, she stopped being able to publish in 25. They needed to go after Akhmatova particularly because she was enormously popular and unfortunately even working class women liked to read Akhmatova. Um, so they, she, she became a class enemy, an embodiment of everything that was wrong with the old society and that was marked specifically as feminine. Well, what happens with Akhmatova afterwards? She can't publish for years and years and years. She keeps hoping she's going to be able to publish. There'll be a temporary relaxation. They say that we'll be able to publish this collection of your poetry, or maybe we'll do a little slim edited volume of your poetry. Doesn't happen, doesn't happen, doesn't happen. Suddenly in 39, there's a relaxation. They say they can publish the Akhmatova. They publish the poem you see on page two. Um, and I have the little translation here at the bottom. Maybe I'll read just a bit of it, at least in Russian. They publish it exactly like this, with the date 1934 at the bottom and no title. You pala kamenaya slova na mayo yishu živuju gruts. Ničivo vidzja bila gatova, spravju se tim kak ni buts. U minja se vodnim mnoga djela, nada pamits da kanca ubic, nada štob duša kam njela, nada snova naučit se žic. Ani to, garjači šeli slijeta, словно праздник за моим окном. Я давно предчувствовала это. Светлый день и опустелый дом. And I found two different variants online. Now I don't know which one is accurate. But if you just look over this poem here, the stony word descended on my living breast. No matter, I was ready. I'll find a way to deal with this. I've got a lot to do today. I need to strike my memory dead and so forth. Um, what does the poem look like? It looks like exactly what the Soviet critics, and what we have to realize here is whenever I say Soviet critics, it's not critic in the Anglo-American sense. It's somebody who's articulating a state program on lyric poetry, which did in fact happen from about 24 on. Trotsky says our age is not lyric. Um, Yuri Tinyanov, another critic of the period, says um, prose gave poetry the boot three years ago in 1924. Well, 21, that's the end of the Civil War in Russia. So the Civil War the triumph of the Bolsheviks is the triumph of prose over lyric sensibility. Um, so there are all these public attacks on lyric poetry that are state orchestrated, this official state policy. I can read a little bit here of what's happening. This is, and this is what Akhmatova becomes the emblem of. Um, this is Nikolai Bukharin, who was the Minister of Enlightenment or Education um, at the time through the early 30s. He says, communist individualism is a contradiction in terms, an oxymoron, a logical solecism. Um, the new proletarian poetry typically employs not the lyric of the personal eye, but the lyric of comradeship. The creating subject of proletarian poetry is not the eye of the poet, but the real most basic creator of the poetry, the collective. These are official pronouncements on the nature of lyric poetry under the, in the early Soviet state. Akhmatova becomes the emblem of that, and how is she perceived in this poem? Let's see. Oh, here, got it for you. They let her back into print. How do they let her back into print? They let her back into print in sort of a paleontological sense. Let's look at how far we've come. This is what the critic, they've made the official decision. We can let a few poems out. Um, and this, was, this is what the official Soviet critical line on it. Akhmatova's poems were written long ago during the difficult period of the bourgeois family's decline. Um, the times have changed. The 17 Soviet years that separate her last two volumes mark a geological era. Her constant theme, he says, is strange, tragic love. Love is punishment and suffering. This is my favorite phrase, the woman's amorous self-crucifixion. Now, how you do an amorous self-crucifixion is entirely beyond me. I think there are much more convenient and you know, straightforward ways to suffer. But he says, our new purpose in life, our orientation towards the general, not the particular or private, towards the fate 
of all mankind has eluded the poet who persists in sacrificing herself for love time and again. So this is why they're letting her be printed. They've come so far that the little love lyric can't hurt them anymore. And how are they reading this poem then? Well, it looks like an unhappy love lyric. It has no title here. It has a date, 1934. She was very careful to put the date in here. The stony word, you guess, the lovers rejected her. It fell on my breast. I, I was ready for it. I knew he was going to dump me. She's always getting dropped in the poetry. There's a way to read the stuff um, sort of built in for everybody who knows her older poetry. I've got a lot to do today, so I have to get over it. I forsake, foresaw this long ago. He would leave me. I'd have the bright day in the deserted home. Very easy. She's already given us the guidelines to read it. Flip the page. This is where you start getting a radically different of the relationship between public and private. Um, the poem that was taken out of context and that was dated 1934 and that was her first official appearance in print, in Soviet print for maybe about 15 years, was actually a section of her great poem Requiem which she wrote between 19, largely between 1935 and 1940 that commemorates the victims of Stalin's great purges and that specifically commemorates the loss of her third husband and who, who was killed during the purges and the imprisonment of her son um, by the, the man who was shot in 21 by the Lev Gumilyov who had a bad mother on Akhmatova and a father who'd been shot in 21. That was really his crime. So they used him, the son, as a way to keep her in line. You know, your son is in prison, your son has been sent to the camps, mind your manners or you're going to be in trouble. Her response was entirely different. She wrote this famous sequence of poems, Requiem. They couldn't be published, of course. They were published in Russia only after her death in 1966. Um, they were smuggled out to the West. And the way she pub the way she disseminated them um, is typical of this kind of society. What you do with the private lyric and why the lyric becomes such an effective weapon under a state that controls all the means of publication. We have writers unions, publication houses and so forth that channel official state directives down to individual writers. You can memorize this stuff and Russians have phenomenal memories for poetry. It's not part of our tradition. We have phenomenal memories for Dr. Susan's song lyrics. It's kind of the same kind of memory, but here it's channeled into poetry. She had a small group of friends um, that would come to her house. She would make them recite the poems one at a time until they had it letter perfect. Then she would, her friend Lydia Chukoska describes it, she would take a match, she had long beautiful fingers, she was long and beautiful and her fingers matched, um, and light the poem on fire and put it into the ashtray. So her friend describes it as the ritual, the reading, the recitation, the, the poem on the page, the match, the ashes. So the poems themselves can die in this system. The poems themselves have to go underground and be maintained only in individual perishable memories. They're not the kind of poems that are described in the handout I gave you, all the definitions here, the poem that lives on the page, the poem that's the official published document. Let me see if I can find one of the quotes about. Yeah, um, this is, this is uh, from a famous text on poetry, Sharon Cameron's Lyric Time. She says, um, the poem's own presence, the lyric's own presence on the page, surrounded as if by nothing, um, takes it out, it's arrested and framed and taken out of the flux of history. Well, it's forgetting, it's one reason I wanted to do the songs, it's forgetting that poems were never intended for the written to page to begin with. Poems are an oral form designed to be performed, um, memorized, created through formulas, and transmitted that way. The page is a modern development, but the poem is not confined to it, and the web is proof of that, um, precisely. That the, the white frame, that's our academic border we put around a poem, you know? You could write a poem on a, a bathroom wall, you can write a poem on a prison wall if you're you know, lucky enough to be in a place where they prison you for poetry. You can do it all kinds of ways, you can memorize it. This is what Akhmatova is doing, and what is the poem about? When it appears in Requiem, it's given the number seven. It's seven out of a sequence of 12 poems. So the first, the minute you get that seven there, you know that this, this is a poem in context. It's part of a sequence. It's given a different title. It's called the sentence, prigavur, not sentence in the sense of a, a grammatical unit, but passing sentence on someone. This is when she finds out about her son's sentence. I think it was 10 years. Um, the poem isn't a thwarted love lyric. It's not a romantic elegy, which would have been safe. Akhmatova is doing what she always did. The poem is a poem of mourning for one specific victim of a mother mourning for her son um, that she takes to exemplify 
and this is what the, the, the larger poem builds up for, exemplifying the sufferings of all the mothers and wives and daughters who've lost their dear ones since the victims were overwhelmingly um, men, um, it becomes a collective expression. So the private poem, in fact, the poem here with the correct title and the correct date, 1939, she had to backdate it so that nobody would connect it with the arrest of her son in 37 um, and the sentencing in 39. The, the private poem, the poem that could only be whispered and memorized by friends, is in fact the one making the public gesture, while the public poem, the one here that's backdated and that uh, looks like a little romantic, oh, there's Akhmatova again, she's gotten dumped again, she's weeping boo-hoo for poor Akhmatova. The one that looks like you can put it into that little framework, the poem outside of the world, the poem that's preoccupied with the inner world of the poet. Um, the public poem is, is the misleading one. The private poem is the one that, in fact, makes the large social and political claims. Um, well, I'm going to move on over to Poland um, and start again with a little quote from Nikolai Bukharin, his pronouncement on poetry that I've already given here. This is Miłosz's song on porcelain. And I want to read again, just briefly, from Bukharin's Official pronouncement, 1934, first meeting of the Soviet Writers' Union um, about poetry. Poetry of, the Soviet poetry is gladness, buoyant, optimistic, triumphal march of millions, so forth, the struggle, the building of a new world. Um, here we find, and this is the part I want to call your attention to, no fog of mysticism, no poetry of the blind, no tragic loneliness of a lost personality, no inconsolable grief of individual, no elegant bric-a-brac of the boudoir or drawing room. I'm not even going to go into the way that Bukharin's statement resonates both with Bakhtin, who I quote here, and with Bakhtin's influence on McGann and the new historicist. McGann specifically says, Bakhtin threw over all my ideas of literature um, that I picked up in graduate school, and I think he means new criticism and kind of old versions of historicism. So Bukharin's quote dovetails very nicely with those, but it also shows, if you looked at the Mandelstam toast, he takes all that bourgeois bric-a-brac and just slaps him in the face with it, um, Miłosz is doing something a little similar here. The poem uh, is written right after the war. It's written while he's stationed, I believe, in Washington. I think it's 1947, 49, something around there. Um, one of his famous things, I'm going to see if I can pull up the song here. We'll see if this one works. I actually hate this song version, but at least you'll hear that a little bit of the public We'll just do a little bit of this. This is a song setting of Miłosz's song on porcelain. Okay, I'm not going to do the whole poem, but one reason I even wanted to play this is I heard this song for the first time speaking of... A song about porcelain doesn't sound like a political poem. It doesn't sound like a socially engaged poem. It sounds like a poem in the mode of um, Keats' Ode on a Grecian Urn or the 20th century version of Keats, which is um, Wallace Stevens' famous poem, I Set a Jar uh, Atop a Hill in Tennessee and Round It Was and Of a Port Like Nothing Else in Tennessee where the art object stands apart from the world. Uh, this one would seem to be a continuation of that in a way, or a mocking of that, or something like that. In fact, it becomes a public statement in a way I'll discuss in just a minute. But the way I first heard it, I was in Poland in 81 um, during Solidarity. I didn't know very much Polish then. I just had one year of Polish. I know it's just like pouring out there, but we're in here. It's okay. You can start drinking now if that will cheer you up. Um, I, so I went to a student cabaret. My Polish was not good. This poem had not yet been translated. And I heard someone with a guitar sing this, this poem. 
And I couldn't understand anything else except a little about, I knew it was a song and I knew it was about porcelain because it's porcelana in Polish. Um, and it stayed with me and I was really hoping I could find that exact version on Google, but I don't know who the student was, I don't know what the setting was, I only found this one and I don't like this one because this guy sounds angry and that's really not the way that the poem works. Um, I don't have time to go through all of it now, but I just want to use this to suggest what bourgeois bric-a-bac, the, the intimate, private, personal world, the significance it carries um, in at least part of the poetry of Eastern Europe that, that sort of rephrases or forces us to readjust the lenses that modern criticism, Anglo-American criticism, has adopted towards the lyric. Um, the translation is brilliant. It's by Miłosz and Robert Pinsky. And one reason it's brilliant is because they knew they had to keep the form. Not just because it's a song, but because it's a poem about forms, about how hard it is to create and sustain human forms. And I'll just read a little tiny bit. You'll hear how brilliantly it's done, but I'm going to bring up a couple of differences between the two texts here. Rose-colored cup and saucer, flowery demitasses, you lie beside the river where an armored column passes. Winds from across the meadow sprinkle the banks with down. A torn apple tree shadow falls on the muddy path. The ground everywhere is strewn with bits of brittle froth. Of all things broken and lost, the porcelain troubles me most. Before the first red tones begin to warm the sky, the, the earth wakes up and moans. It is the small, sad cry of cups and saucers cracking, the master's precious dream of roses, of mowers raking, and shepherds on the lawn. The black underground stream swallows the frozen swan. This morning, as I walk past, the porcelain troubled me most. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole thing now, but I want to call attention to one thing that's not there in the translation. It's, it is, as I said, a brilliant translation, and one reason I think it's brilliant is Pinsky and Miłosz together seem to have brought all these little hints of the pastoral tradition from English language poetry um, into the translation. There's a resonance there that, that isn't quite what's in the Polish, but it works. It works really well. Um, but what's going on in the Polish here? I'll give you one, you, you heard it sung there, but there's something here. This is a voice poem. Miłosz starts out using somebody else's voice, which is typical for him, and it's something he picked up, in fact, from Eliot, from his readings of Eliot during the war and after. Um, the, the last phrase here, I know there, who, who knows Polish in the audience? I know there's several people. There's a phrase, the last, the refrain of the, the poem is, niczego mi proszę pana tak nie żal jak porcelany. And proszę pana, is besides proszę pani, the phrase you hear absolutely the most anywhere you go among Polish speakers. And it's untranslatable, it's a filler phrase. It's like, you know, except it's much more formal than you know, it's using the Polish formal phone, form. It means literally, how, literally, I don't even know how you translate it literally. Um, would you, it's mister and, and mistress or something, or that pan pani, be so kind, I don't know. There's no way to literally translate it, but it creates a voice. That one phrase creates a voice here. And who is it who's mourning porcelain? What you're getting here is a landscape of wartime Poland, clearly, of a Poland that's been absolutely devastated by war, where you have, everything is broken. The apple tree's shadow is broken, uh, bits of brittle froth, you have uh, the mounds of these new graves, a litter of handle and spout, you have the mourning and the moaning. Um, this is a, a landscape of catastrophe. Who gets bugged the most by porcelain? You know, the whole country has been absolutely devastated. Um, Robert Pinsky even talks about reading this translation at public readings and saying, you know, people would say, well, who the hell does he think he is saying porcelain bugs me the most? You know, you've had three million Jews, three million Poles. The casualties are enormous. You know, 30%, what is it? Six million out of 36 million killed. And, well, the speaker is a bourgeois housewife. That's all it can be. Somebody who's lost her China and keeps saying proszę panam. Nothing bothers me as much as... Your first instinct is to say, I'm going to do emotional distancing. This is some little housewife who really doesn't, you know, hasn't registered anything or is too petty or is in denial or is in post-traumatic stress or something, and all she can do is say, my dishes, my dishes. But the voice shifts as it goes along here. It becomes a poet's voice. Um, by the time you get to the next one, where they introduce all the sort of pastoral imagery, um, the mowers raking, the shepherds on the lawn, and the black underground stream swallows the frozen swan, um, that's, that's not a bourgeois housewife anymore, even though the refrain still is in Polish, niczego mi proszę pana tak nie żal jak porcelane. Um, 
it's already different. I was trying to think really hard about the frozen swan in here because the first association I had, and I think I'm right, and Miłosz didn't say I was wrong. I gave him something I wrote about it, and he didn't say I was wrong, and so either he was being nice or I'm right, and you're just going to have to take my word for it, is I think it's a reference to Mallarmé. He has a famous sonnet about the frozen swan as the emblem of art. Um, the frozen swan goes underground. They're not moan, mourning for the frozen swan, you know, that's lost. The idea of high art, an art that's a beautiful, exquisite form, divorced for life. The mourning is for cups and saucers, but it's, it's a, only a poet who would make that reference. And it works on a couple of levels. In the, the Polish, it says, the feathers of the frozen swans. Um, and I was trying to think about that one. There's a, a famous china pattern. You probably have all seen it with the little loops going up, like, like little feathery things going all around. That's what you're mourning for, and why are you mourning for that? Um, well, Miłosz, in his, his book, The Captive Mind, that I've already mentioned, talks about he's in Russia briefly during the war. He gets bounced around from place to place like so many other people, and sees a Polish family being sent into exile, Siberia, Kazakhstan, we don't know where. He sees this little family sitting and having tea. They're still being a family. They're still maintaining they're private, personal, individual. They haven't let themselves be turned into numbers yet. And I think that's what he's mourning here. And he's saying poetry is kind of a simulacrum. It's delicacy, it's form, it's perishability, which Akhmatova brings up in Requiem, in the, the rituals going around Requiem, that the poem can perish, the poem can die. And we all know it can. You know, think of how many fragmentary poems we have that we will never find the whole piece of the poem. You know, that our, our tradition, in fact, begins in fragments um, that will never be completely uncovered. Um, they get broken, and these little tiny, humble bourgeois forms that pre preserve and contain individual life um, are what poetry becomes an emblem for in a positive sense here. So the way in which the new historicists interpret the lyric as sort of an emblem for pseudo-bourgeois individual autonomy, you know, alone, isolated on the page, gets flipped around in this Eastern European tradition that says perishable, isolated little selves are the most precious thing we have and they're the easiest things to break and they become one on a, a sort of a continuum with all these items, all these tiny things we use to create our fragile individual little lives. I'm going to just, I'm not going to do joy of writing here. We, I don't want to run over my time. I just wanted to show you another meditation just to give an example of way, the way that lyric as the private genre can be changed. I pulled up tons of these. No, I'll do just one if I can get the, the web connection here. Um, I have one for the Guggenheim. The, the artist Jenny Holzer loves the final poet that I'll read one poem. I won't interpret it, but I'll read it for you by way of conclusion. Um, she loves uh, Wisława Szymborska, and she uses her price precisely as a way to mediate between public and private by projecting her poems on buildings around the world. This is on the Guggenheim. Think about how this changes how a poem operates. This is a poem called Tortures, one of her more public poems. This isn't how they actually work. She actually projects the whole poem, and you watch it going up, and it goes over passersby and cars. It gets reflected in water. It does all sorts of unpredictable things. Um, but I wanted to wait until I got it up to The Joy of Writing, a very private poem about the hypothetical worlds created in poetry which she turns here. That's what you've got right now is the poem, the final poem in your handout is the one that's being projected out here, which is about precisely creating a little lyric reality and its fragility, that the little lyric reality is frail, it's easily breakable. I'll pull this off here and I'm gonna conclude with a poem. I'm just gonna read it. We can talk about it afterwards if anybody wants to. A poem that Szymborska wrote um, for September 11th. And she wrote it, Susie Linfield actually writes about the photographs that she used um, for, that inspired the poem. Um, they were the people jumping. We have kind of a, a moratorium on those photos. They were never publicly done in the West. They're in, in, 
the states. In Europe, they were all over the place, and I still can't bear to look at them. I actually went and looked at them online because I felt like if Szymborska is brave enough to write a poem about it, I should be brave enough to look. But one of the other definitions on the sheet you have there that I particularly love, um, and I'll end with this idea, is from Angus Fletcher, who, towards a new theory of American poetry. Um, I think it's on the sheet there. If not, I'll just give you a... Um, Yeah, this is my favorite quote for the lyric in the modern world. He says, lyric verse focuses larger issues on delimited screens and hence intensifies social issues to the point where individual readers and writers can begin as individuals to think these matters through according to their own personal lights. Um, the poem I'm about to read exemplifies that for me. I cannot bear to look at the picture Szymborska looked at. They use um, telescopic lenses to do close-ups of these people. I've never seen the close-ups. She did, because they were all across these European um, journals and newspapers. And she wrote this poem, um, photographed from September 11th. They jumped from the burning floors, one, two, a few more, higher, lower. The photograph halted them in life and now keeps them above the earth, toward the earth. Each is still complete, with a particular face and blood well hidden. There's enough time for hair to come loose, for keys and coins to fall from pockets. They're still within the air's reach, within the compass of places that have just now opened. I can do only two things for them, describe this flight and not add a last line. I'll end with that.